at some point in my life, I, I hope I come across some literature that explains the emergence of spontaneous silence uh, at crowd events when the, when the crowd tells the, the, I mean, it doesn't matter whether we're sitting here or there, but some signal emerges in the collective and the collective lets the people up front know, we are ready for you to begin. And since I've received the, uh, the, 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 the signal, the group signal that comes from our collective entanglement, uh, let's begin. I'd like to welcome all of you to Union Theological Seminary and this Insight Project conversation with Dr. Catherine Keller. In the course of our visit from our previous speaker, our immediately previous Insight Project speaker, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, some of us asked her what steps, small and large, we can take to further our relationships with indigenous communities. Dr. Kimmerer mentioned and in fact urged us to take one small but significant step, and that is to begin all our events with land acknowledgement. So in honoring her request, I would like to begin our time together by remembering that we gather on the lands of the Lenape people. We cannot begin to think about a just political theology of the earth without remembering the unfinished work of repair and reconciliation that remains for us to do with First Nations communities. Let me say now a word about the Insight Project. It is a multi-year program series that seeks to put theology in conversation with a wide range of partners in the humanities, social sciences, and the natural sciences. At its core, Insight seeks to redefine our understanding of theology, not simply through the reformulation of doctrine, but through a reframing of the imagination. Insight holds that theology is at its creative best when it is in living encounter with the widest range of interlocutors on vital issues of contemporary moment. This year, the theme is Theology and the Natural World. And in addition to these featured events, the grant gives us an opportunity also to conduct a class. So many of the students here are in that class. So we're working through a number of uh, the texts by the speakers, including the book for today. Uh, all of uh, the entire book has already been read by our students. All of this has made, has been made possible through the generosity of Mary Coelho, an alumnus of uh, Union Theological Seminary, whose passion for a contemporary and credible theology makes this event and indeed this entire series possible. Mary, if you are uh, watching at home, I'm looking directly into the camera. We, we, uh, we welcome you and also offer our thanks. By now, the format of this evening should be fam familiar to you for those of you who are veterans to this. Uh, Dr. Keller will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and then Andrea White and I will converse with Dr. Keller. We mean quite seriously that we're uh, about conversation rather than serial lecturing. So much of the time will be given to conversation between us, and then you will be invited to join that conversation as well. Now let me introduce both our respondent and our uh, speaker. Professor Andrea White, my colleague here at Union, specializes in constructive Christian theology, especially womanist theology and postmodern religious thought, with research interests in theologies of otherness, the doctrine of God, theological anthropology, and the relationship between philosophy and theology. She is a recipient of the Lilly Theological Research Faculty Fellowship from the Association of Theological Schools and the Louisville Institute Book Grant for Minority Scholars both awarded for her research work, culminating in a forthcoming monograph, The Scandal of Flesh, Black Women's Bodies and God's Politics. She is also at work on another monograph, The Back of God, A Theology of Otherness in Karl Barth and Paul Ricoeur. I could go on for quite a length about her enormous accomplishments um, and her work, not merely as an intellectual, but as an activist, she is the founding member, for example, a founding member of the Carter Center Scholars in Action, organized to combat violence and discrimination against women and girls. 
Um, and, and in this way, she embodies something very dear to us here at Union, the, the marriage of rigorous intellectual labor with public activism and public scholarship. She's very, very smart. <laughs> A bit scarily so. <clears throat> Catherine Keller is no stranger to our Union community. She visits our classes and doctoral seminars and participates in our common life to such an extent that I think we should give her a t-shirt or some official signification that she is an honorary member of the Union co community. At least a t-shirt, I think. We'll have to work on that. <clears throat> Fortunately, despite the frequency of her visits, I don't think we take her for granted. And well, we shouldn't. When the religious history of the late 20th and early 21st century is written, I'm confident that Catherine Keller will be heralded as one of the most influential and creative theologians of our time. In virtually anyone's list of major creative the theological voices currently producing original work, I think Catherine would have to be mentioned alongside the likes of Rowan Williams, Jürgen Moltmann, and her teacher, John Cobb. Her major works are required reading in all of the leading seminaries in this country and far beyond. They are marked by wide-ranging originality at the highest theoretical levels, and yet virtually every sentence also resonates with ethical passion and power. Dr. Keller integrates several major intellectual trajectories into her work, process theology, feminist theology, postmodern thought, but all in the interest of reimagining Christian theology for our times. Her work is also routinely marked by a striking attention and creative attention to the reading and rereading of biblical texts. That's evident in books like The Face of the Deep, which, which, is, which is a sustained reading, at least one way of reading that book, of uh, Genesis creation narratives. And of course, um, she returns time and again to Revelation um, in uh, Apocalypse Now and Then, a Feminist Guide to the End of the World, and another Apocalypse book that she's writing for reasons I suspect I don't need to tell you. More recently, um, her work has taken attention to Christian mystical and apophatic theologies, as well as an attention to contemporary sciences, including chaos and complexity theory, quantum physics, and paying special attention to questions of entanglement and relationality. I could go on like this again for some time, but I'll save Catherine from further embarrassment and conclude by saying that she not only writes about relationality in her theologies, but she lives out a relational way of being in the world in caring for her colleagues and her students and even her colleagues' students, which is quite, I, I would say, unusual. For all these gifts, both scholarly and relational, we give her thanks and welcome, to, welcome her to our company. Catherine. Well, I'll just throw off the embarrassment and say, I think I don't want a t-shirt, but a, a, a baseball cap with, okay. with Union on it. Yeah, thank you. Um, but I, I do feel a, a deep sense of, of home now at Union, but, the, but it's a home that I never do take for granted. Uh, and therefore, it's a home that I enter now at your invitation uh, with a real sense of, of honor. And, and I, love, I love that now you're doing the, the land greeting, too. So this is another dimension of, of, of home <laughs> that I'm feeling coming up through my feet uh, right now. Um, so why this book? political theology of the earth with this subtitle that was pulled out of me by the editor wanting, wanting this to be really clear and get, get out there a bit. Our planetary emergency and the struggle for a new public. Well, I wrote this book out of a sense of some uh, fear uh, that was getting to me, a fear of a kind of triple apocalypse. I started it 
before the election, actually, but not very much before the election. So I, I sensed uh, what was coming, and then I had a lot of time to revise it after the election, um, so as to be in, in touch with what had happened. So the political dimension of what gets called apocalypse, well, that's just in our face. Uh, and occupying a lot of our attention in, relations to, in relation to every, every register of, of social justice. Uh, and yeah, that's the political, but of the earth, earth because the earth apocalypse is upon us. I'll give away right now, rather than holding you in suspense, <laughs> that for me, apocalypse does not mean the end of the world, as it does not mean that in the Bible, uh, but it certainly involves amazing levels of, of destruction uh, and, and the threat of even scarier levels of destruction. And we are so preoccupied with trying to put out the fires in relation to to, to new depredations uh, week by week in terms of, of race, in terms of sexuality and gender, uh, that the earth apocalypse can always just go into the background. It, it seems like it can wait. Uh, but we know better now, don't we? IPCC gives us 10 years or so to make bigger changes uh, and with greater cooperation than the nations of the world have ever come close to doing before. And because of the political uh, pushing in a completely denialist direction in this crucial country, uh, the earth gets pushed ever more aggressively into the background and those of us who are not denialists sometimes indirectly collude because we have other more immediate human issues to take care of. So these are embedded apocalypses. And then, well, the apocalypse of theology itself and the crises of the church uh, and our uncertainty as to just what uh, our future is if we identify with, uh, with a religion uh, certainly with the church, certainly with the mainline church, but I won't, I won't go there right now. You know, I'm a United Methodist, so I am, and my school are, are reeling from the shock of, of what went on in St. Louis earlier this month, uh, and it's not clear uh, how much we'll be able to recover as an institution or as a community from what happened there. So, there you have it, a kind of triply embedded apocalypse that was motivating the writing of this book, but not so I could come and communicate my fear or dump it on any reader. No, actually, it's a political theology that's at the same time a political theology uh, in that it, it, it has echoing through at 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 32, I want you to be Amerimnos, free from care, free from care. And as I learned from Agamben, who's not a Christian or a theist, but deeply involved in political theology and in Paul, uh, this, is, this is coming, of course, right after 729. And the verse usually is translated there, the time, the time that remains is short. The time remaining to us is short, or the appointed time is short, an even worse translation. But what Agamben clued me into is this doesn't, this doesn't hack it. The word for short here is sun est almenos, which means contracted or ingathered or summing up in itself. So much more interesting than just short. And then the time here is not chronos, which would be measurable and counting down to some linear end of a linear line of history. No, it's kairos, that word for the fullness of time. So there's something about the contractedness of time in this fullness. So that's an important meditation 
uh, through this book. I'm hoping that, that the structure of the book expresses its content uh, and tries to do so concretely then in the form of three chapters. You see it's a pretty short little book. I'm very proud of that. Uh, but three chapters then on the political, on the earth, and on theology. So the political, of political theology. Well, the phrase political theology, as some of you know too well and others uh, perhaps not at all, uh, is, is, is largely now funneled through a kind of conversation uh, that got going uh, already in the early 20th century and in, in, in a troubling way, uh, but then has gotten picked up again in interesting different waves, theological, uh, in the post-Holocaust theologians of Germany, Moltmann, Metz, and Dorothea Zoller, who picked it up, and what they were doing was actually denazifying the phrase because it was, it was a phrase that was really advanced and made, made significant for political and legal theory by Carl Schmitt, who is a brilliant thinker uh, from whom one learned some necessary political conceptualizations, uh, but who ended up uh, being the major uh, legal theorist for Hitler uh, for at least a couple of years. Uh, and that's important to how one reads him and what one learns from him uh, about, about the fascism. So from Schmidt, one gets that all significant concepts of the modern theory of the state, this is his language, are secularized theological concepts, all significant concepts of modern politics are actually secularized theology. So that's a really important thought for those of us who feel uh, marginalized uh, because of our involvement in theology. It's kind of, it, it, it kind of sets up a, a cool interdisciplinarity, and that's this new wave then of, of uh, discussion of political theology with the likes of Agamben and you know, A to Z, Zizek, on, and, and Badiou, so lots of continental political theorists who are probably atheists or heavily secular and not writing as theologians, but who find this thought crucial. And it has to do with reflection on what you've heard of as the post-secular. So Schmidt goes on to give the, the great example of sovereignty as a political concept that is secularized theology. He wrote, the omnipotent God became the omnipotent lawgiver. And he thinks that's how it should be. And that liberalism was, and democracy were destroying sovereignty in Germany between the wars, et cetera, <laughs> and through the spread of secular democracy. So for him, sovereignty, what's that? That is the, that is the, the power uh, of the ruler or the state uh, in the exception, as he calls it, in the exception, which in German is the same then as in the state of emergency. So the ruler is the one who might set the law, but who also can transcend it, who is above the law. And that's proven by the state of emergency, which was, of course, crucial uh, for, for Hitler's coming to power, a declared state of emergency, which was then the rule. <laughs> it, it was never suspended. It's not altogether coincidental that we're in a, a state of, of emergency right now, uh, at least not coincidental from this point of view. And so the exceptional leader is to unite us against the exceptional alien or the enemy. I was helped in my book making connection to this notion of, ex of the exception with its, uh, with its uh, resonance with fascism. Uh, with then uh, what Kelly Brown Douglas uh, does so beautifully in her Stand the Ground chapter on Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. So in my book, I connect then the Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, which she so shows rolling into white exceptionalism with US exceptionalism and, and the kind of enmity that it breeds and in fact that it requires. So whiteness requires, of course, blackness. Um, and this 
coordinates with the basic understanding of politics at work in Schmidt, and I think in an inherent way in any authoritarian concept of sovereignty, uh, where, uh, as Schmidt put it so clearly, politics is a matter of friend versus foe. Tell me who your enemy is, and I'll tell you who you are, uh, he says. And he mocked the notion that Christian love should be political. Now, he was a strong, kind of strange, uh, reactionary Roman Catholic, divorced. And, but um, he was <laughs> all very concerned with bringing Christian rhetoric back into the political sphere and desecularizing it in important ways. But Christian love, that was to stay strictly uh, between between friends, members of, of private communities. Um, so one can call this sense of enmity as founding politics, um, then what, what, what would be a kind of sovereign antagonism. And I'm helped a lot by William Connolly's work who juxtaposes antagonism and its sovereignty to what he calls respectful agonism, agonism referring to struggle, and it might be struggle against an enemy, uh, but it might also be struggle with uh, your friends or your colleagues uh, or your allies, uh, and, and those struggles can be very painful and deep, but you're struggling with, not against them, and it is struggling for something. Uh, so, Yes, a respectful agonism, and there is a respect then of perhaps the enemy, but as, as enemy who might remain enemy and need to be defeated, perhaps not destroyed. So I try to theologize then the, the sense of agonism as amorous agonism, a love, however, <laughs> that may be sparked and uh, and indeed energized by, by anger, uh, by rage. It has something to do, this amorous agonism with what at Union, uh, through Serene Jones leadership, is often called revolutionary love. So then I'm defining the political as a struggle, uh, a struggle across critical difference, difficult difference, difference that in, in, involves making difficult decisions across critical difference for a more common good, but I think that common good in cahoots with Fred Moten's undercommons, uh, which is actually a radically relational view. <laughs> we owe each other everything, he writes. So for me then, an alternative to the sovereign exceptionalism can be called radical intersectionalism. And this is demanding agonism with potential allies, as I said, not just with opposites, and therefore makes possible what Connolly calls broad spectrum, radically democratic coalition that might be big enough and strong enough actually to defeat that which uh, insists upon its enmity. Yet a still deeper intersectionalism is demanded of us in the theological world. And so I want to embed the, the Anglo-Saxon, the white, the US exceptionalism in relation to Christian exceptionalism. And then also you know, with its uh, exclusivist claim on salvation and all, uh, and its, its potent <laughs> moves towards sovereign, sovereignty of of the uh, religious right and its model uh, white male Christians and its white male Jesus. And then deeper yet than the Christian exceptionalism, the human exceptionalism. So chapter two is on the earth. And just to say a little bit of where I go with that, the misreading of the Imago Dei and of the notion of dominion has preoccupied prior works of mine. That misreading has everything to do with runaway climate change, given the potent alliance between the religious right and its dominionism with the, the 1% and its global capitalism. Its capitalism, 
that from the coal-fired English Industrial Revolution on through fossil fuel-addicted global capitalism is, of course, the primary cause of global warming. But the human exceptionalism is the deep justification that we're an exception to all the other creatures. And again, realize exception doesn't mean different. Of course, we're different from all the other creatures. Of course, we're remarkably different in very gifted and interesting and, <laughs> and dangerous ways. Uh, yeah, exceptionalism, I'm arguing, is the wrong way to uh, capture difference. So a deep intersectionalism then would rewrite the very meaning of bodies, of their mattering, of their materialization, which happens always and only in networks of deep interdependence, that is, deep intersectionalism. And since that ontological material level of our intersecting, not just with each other as humans, but with all the other creatures making us up, goes largely unrecognized, it has been able to be aggressively exploited uh, and has allowed the tragic unfolding of the now species suicidal trajectory, uh, which continues to require that we willfully ignore, uh, that is, white out uh, our deep intersectionals with the rest of the creation. That brings me to Ed Roberson, who's the poet I won't quote much of now, but who wrote a poem called To See the Earth Before the End of the World. People are grabbing at the chance to see the earth before the end of the world, the world's death piece by piece, each larger than we. It's reflecting on time. Roberson is, is I would think, the, the leading African-American eco-poet. <laughs> and interesting is meditating on the horrific speed of the melting of, of glaciers in their shining whiteness. Uh, and he talks elsewhere about, uh, for him, poetry being a way to unwhite out our language. I love that irony. So eco-theology, like eco-poetics, depends upon science. So I'm really glad for that focus of the Insight Project. And climate science is sounding ever more apocalyptic. Recently, the New York Times had the major piece on the insect apocalypse, for instance. Uh, oh, of course, there's some pushback. Uh, might not be for, it might not be that um, you know, we're already at 40% uh, insect death everywhere on the planet. But climate science, giving us our, our decade or so, uh, more is, is going to be casting up apocalyptic metaphors ever more frequently, which means theology needs to be uh, addressing that language ever more vocally and responsibly. And I'm seeing in this book, uh, in my Earth chapter, that it's not just climate science we need, but the science of matter itself. That means we need cosmology. We need reflection on what the creation is made of. Genesis, how all of its critters become. New materialism has been very helpful in this regard. And I'm so glad for you that uh, Jane Bennett, one of the leading voices among new materialists, uh, will be here in this series rather soon. Her book, Vibrant Matter, gets at this character of, of matter that is profoundly uh, interdependent in every of its elements which have life force to them, all of them, even at the inorganic level. And her thinking uh, is, is influenced ever more so actually by that of Alfred North Whitehead from whom she, in that book, takes the notion of nature as generativity, as a continuous stream of occurrence. Well, I depend much too much on Whitehead to even open that door uh, right now. But let me also mention the physics of Karen Barad as important to this book. Uh, her 
feminist philosophy of physics as she grew into after uh, first a career as a, as a physicist. Uh, and her notion of <laughs> queer critters in the quantum void is actually uh, a work of genius in, in her analysis of the intraactive agency of all creatures uh, beginning uh, with what she's focusing on, which is at the quantum level, the electronic level. So let me just touch down concludingly on the third chapter, uh, theology, where I hope the intersectionalism gets yet deeper, <laughs> perhaps too deep for words. And so the sense of, of apophatic theology, the theology of, of unsaying uh, becomes uh, crucial here, even for doing politics. It was the subject of my cloud of the impossible, an old metaphor for the, the deep mystery that deepens into unspeakability of what we name God. Uh, but I, I also pick up a deep theological intersectionalism, again, from Paul, <laughs> who speaks of this God in whom we move and live and have our being in Acts. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians, again, speaks of how all are alive in the Messiah, which gets rather misleadingly translated Christ. All are made alive in the Messiah so that God may be all in all. All, no exceptions. <laughs> and it's a God all in. No external up there, transcendent, merely outside God nor any reduction to flat imminence, but this is pan en theos, all in God, uh, which of course lets me make a loop through process pan entheism, not pantheism, process pan entheism, and its strong argument versus omnipotence uh, and the kind of the kind of secularized theological havoc that omnipotence, the notion of divine power as all controlling power has wreaked uh, throughout uh, Christian civilization and continues to now with the way in which it's used to support climate denialism and to support uh, what the right wing happily calls the Trumpocalypse, uh, honoring it, bringing it on. Uh, so, I think I need to stop for now um, and, and hope that in our discussion, some more of these themes will, will open up. Because for me, the, the apophasis, this mystical unsaying, actually flows in a strange, rather dark way into the apocalypsis uh, that I want us not to live in fear of remembering always that, the, that if a political theology of the earth is going to answer the triple apocalypse, it'll have to lift up the actual meaning of apocalypse, not as closure, shutdown of the world, closing of history, but rather as disclosure, apocalypsis, an opening up of possibility, uh, a sense that at the heart of every creature, <laughs> there is calling going on, a divine calling perhaps, not silenced, but rarely heard, uh, not a sovereign command of the exception, but as new possibility, the grace of an inception. Let me stop there and open up. Catherine, I wonder if I can start with a fairly um, broad question. A good chunk of our time in our class has gone to diagnosing how we got ourselves into this predicament, uh, this triple predicament where our theologies are failing, our church life is failing at precisely the moment that our 
political life is failing and the planet is failing, right? You, you nicely trace the connection between those triple failures um, and root them each in a kind of exceptionalism, right? The, the political sovereign, um, the man as the exception, and then all of this rooted somehow in the God who stands over against us as an exception. Um, when people do diagnoses of how one enters into a situation like this, um, sometimes, maybe, maybe especially we theologians, like to say, well, you know, it's, it's all because we got the theology wrong, uh, sometimes, say, in the Middle Ages, and it's, it's been downhill since then, right? Um, I don't really see you quite saying that. You, you do say that there's something direly wrong about an exceptionalist God who is all-powerful and could save us from these pickles by extraordinary fiat or miracle and so forth. Um, but I don't see you saying, if we get our theology right, uh, then everything will magically fix itself. And you know, I, I, don't, I don't say this, you know, facetiously. There are contemporary theologians who say just this sort of thing, right? If we get our theologies right, if theology were to be more prominent in our common life, if we were to diagnose that it was theology that went wrong that got us here in the first place, we wouldn't be in this mess. Right? Uh, I'm curious how you how you avoid saying all of those things and yet center theology's importance in, uh, in the time that remains. So. Mm. That's a, a rich, shadowy question. Um, yeah, you're right. I don't think that if we would just fine tune our theology, then we could insert the right theology into the secularization process and the right politics would emerge on the other end and we'd be, we'd be fine again. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We theologians would be so <laughs> exceptional. And, yeah, and we would, we would be you know, functioning in the image of an omnipotent deity. Um, but I am tempted to something that's not very far from that. <laughs> Uh, it, it justifies work as a theologian. You know, if I just just sit sit at my computer long enough and get the theology right, then you know I can secretly <laughs> insert it into into the, the, the national unconscious and poof. Uh, no, but but I am seriously tempted to think that there is work for us to do. Uh, those of us who. Uh, work with theological language. I don't think uh, the work that's needed for the world is going to come mainly from us, uh, from us who are still involved in theology. I don't know who it's going to come mainly from. I'm not predicting that. I think, it, I think we might be a crucial part of it, partly because we reach really wide publics, potentially, even, even as many of our denominations and churches seem to be failing. Uh, we still uh, have reverb out into, into huge publics, and we should take that seriously, and even more seriously work on the way the church publics can join in coalitions with uh, non-church religious publics and with uh, irreligious publics. This is where Connolly's work on a broad spectrum uh, sense of assemblage uh, of coalitional uh, radical democracy uh, is, I think, very helpful. And he, as a non-theist, uh, is often working, reaching out very seriously to, uh, to different religious groups. And he'll be at our conference on political theology uh, doing the opening talk this uh, Saturday, which I hope many of you can come to. Flyers are there. Um, so I think that uh, that a lot has gone wrong because of the way Christianity, as it became Constantinian, did its political theology. How it became, instead of the strong and indeed apocalyptic witness against the Roman Empire, uh, became the Roman Empire and its 
key justification. Of course, some things were improved. There were hospitals <laughs> for the poor under Constantine and in Byzantium. It, it, it wasn't just the same. Uh, the killing of, of anyone was seen as a sin and soldiers had to go through a purification process. So I, I don't want to just simply stereotype Byzantine Christianity as just the Christianized Roman Empire, but it was also the Christianized Roman Empire. And, and, and so the notion of divine sovereignty pumped up imperial power and then state power, and then it moved into Western imperial forms, and those broke up with just horrific violence in the Thirty Years' War. Uh, proportionately, significantly worse violence than both world wars uh, together. Uh, and, and that was just more Christian sovereignty in the image of the sovereign God. So there's a lot we got really wrong, and at the same time, there were, there were the alternative movements. And I won't get into a lecture on that, but I, I did a lot of this already in Apocalypse Now and Then, back in the 90s, really realizing that Apocalypse isn't just used by the religious right and its antecedents, various fanaticisms, it's also the basis for all of the, all of the uh, revolutionary movements of the Western world, according to Ernst Bloch, Maris Winfield nodding, because he's read Bloch more carefully than I have now. Uh, but all of those revolutionary movements, democratic and socialist, Ernst Bloch, as a good atheist socialist, shows come out of the Christian uh, radical movements, apocalyptically charged, that get going about 1,000 years ago through Joachim of Fiore, then the radical Franciscans, you're familiar with the radical Reformation. Uh, and, and, and that led to great and self-destructive violence, as it turned out, but also the nonviolent movements, like the Quakers and the Shakers, uh, are taking up this alternative, deeply Christian impulse. And these are traditions with wide networks and incredible influence in history. I mean, you write about the connection between the Quakers and Gandhi and Martin Luther King and all apophatic in their deep practices of, of silent listening uh, and radically nonviolent, but radically so and, and world changing. So I think we have a lot of work that we actually can do and that our failing is no excuse to quit. That's why I lean so heavily into, into Jack Haberstam's uh, notion of fail better, which she's, she, he, they are, uh, are, are exploring in the queer art of failure, picking up from, uh, Sam, from, from uh, Samuel Beckett, uh, who, who coined the, the notion of you know, fa yes, failing, fail, fail again, never mind, fail better. Uh, and he also goes on in another line, and it's in his last play, to say, uh, unknow better now. So fail better now, unknow better now. Thank you, John, and thank you, Catherine. I'm thrilled to have this conversation with this book as I watched it being birthed, and I remember uh, the very first conversation we had on the corner of 57th and 7th over 20 years ago when I was a prospective doctoral student. And uh, I've been a student of yours for since then. Uh, and now I get to have this conversation with you. And I, I remember, I'm going to take a cue from something you said in that conversation. You were, uh, actually, we were both reading a rigorai. And I remember you were <laughs> expressing frustration. Where's the thesis? Where's the thesis? And then you said, well, it's in the fold. It's in the middle of the book. And th there's the thesis. Uh, not where you would expect to find it. So I'm going to actually uh, take that as a cue to not start at the beginning <laughs> and ask a question uh, that actually uh, runs throughout, but it's, it's uh, something that comes up in your afterward. I want to begin where you end, because any political theology of the earth paying attention would surely conjure a sense of despair 
and would offer a brutal reprimand for anthropogenic climate destruction. Yet your book ends with a tone that is surprisingly persistent, persistent throughout the book, and it's a tone of hopefulness. You say, human creatures occasionally do actually rise to the occasion. To stay with the struggle means to enter not the continuum of dread, you write. You urge us to decide that it is too late, that would be as irresponsible as living like there is no such thing. You close with a question that emerges from your friend's timely query about the high, high intelligence of birds. And you, you ask, do we get a hunch as to our own political possibilities? And then you boldly proclaim, Blake, dra black draped as we come, we have it in us to get it together. In the fierce urgency of our all too human now, what local planetary solidarity might emerge. Why not become the new earth, the new public we imagine? So my question for you is how do you account for this persistent gaze at a possible future? Not just how, but why should one remain free from the fear of time limits? One might even say it's not cool to be hopeful these days, All right? I mean, there are a number of voices that talk about um, black pessimism. Um, you know them all. Oh, Afro-pessimism so. is a very, very serious, very brilliant set of voices. Uh, and of course, uh, embracing hopelessness is an important work of, of theology uh, by Miguel de la Torres. Uh, I get these views. It, I disagree with the rhetorical twist, though I see why it's important to find a lot of language other than that of hope, like a lot of language other than that of love or of faith, because all of our great Christian language uh, has, has been either defanged and turned into cliches or weaponized to be used in, in some, some utterly uh, autoallergic form. Nonetheless, I think hopelessness is a whole lot more dangerous than hope. So here's the Karl Barth quote, <laughs> my only one, you know, that we as Christians are neither optimistic nor pessimistic, but hopeful. So it seems to me as Americans, we have to just constantly distinguish hope from optimism. And usually when people are being hip and giving up on hope, uh, they are uh, just hip, hip hopping along with, you know, this notion of, of optimism. They're confusing the two, and optimism with its sense of a, of, a, of a temporal, linear kind of reliable motion towards the desired outcome. Now, so I love Joseph Power's concept, his deep meditation on a, on a hope draped in black. He's coming out of critical race theory, and he's not giving up on hope, um, just on all the, the junk forms that conceal the forms of, of, of racial and other uh, destruction of the, <laughs> the, the chance of a society that we actually might want to have in, in common. So yeah. I'm, I'm landing at the end of the book with those, <laughs> those, th those starlings, and the starling murmuration was the phrase that I, I learned about through a friend. Uh, and it's not just that starlings are smart, is it? It's their, and that's why you're pointing it out, that they're, they're smart in this intriguing way where it looks like, uh, you know, the starlings are the one, we have them over the Hudson, they're the, they're the ones that have the huge dark clouds of, of bird flight, and, and if you meditate on them, you'll see how it's almost impossible, how they all shift at the same moment, uh, how they're con and yet they're responding spontaneously to breezes and other conditions, and responding spontaneously altogether. <laughs> it's like what Kieran Barad does with, uh, with, with quantum entanglement. Uh, but the thing about starlings is they're, they seem, they seem to be each tuned in 
always to at least seven other starlings, a minimum of seven others. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's a sort of seven times seven times seven into their, into their murmuration, that's the name of the collective, of, of, of often thousands. Uh, but I've read since the book uh, a little more on starling murmurations, and there's pretty good evidence that they're all, that each one is actually in some way that's measurable uh, responding to all of the others. And that's unfathomable. And that's what Karen Barad, the physicist theorist, is saying we, we need to tune into. And now she's saying uh, in our Entangled Worlds uh, book from our TTC series, where she actually gets a little theological out of her, her Jewish uh, tradition and her working with, uh, with Butler and, and also with uh, Benjamin and with Kabbalah. But she's saying now for ecological and for reasons of, of fighting back against the, the racism and the economic destructiveness and the sexism and the heterosexism, for all of these reasons of our collective uh, sickness, we need to tune in to what she lifts up from the electronic level in which the, the starlings embody at a level much closer to ours. Um, uh, that is a, an attunement to the way in which, like it or not, we are so radically enmeshed in each other, interdependent on each other. But this is like distinguish hope from optimism distinguish relationality from harmony. You know, just because we're all interdependent, uh, just because we might be really entangled together in what Einstein's called disapprovingly of this new science coming up in quantum, spooky action at a distance, just because of that interrelatedness doesn't mean, uh, you know, like we are at one with one another. It's because we're interdependent that we, that we hurt each other so unbearably. It's because you get under my skin. Uh, it's because you can, you can really, with, with deep knowing, uh, advance your enmity against me uh, or I against you. Uh, it's because of the, the horrors that come from the, the whiting out of our interdependence, that our interdependence doesn't go away, it just, it just turns lethal. So there might be something utterly politically crucial about enfolding these concepts <laughs> of, of radical uh, interdependence uh, with some dark hope in, into our work together. But now you make me want to go back to River Eye with you and think about those folds. I think she was thinking about the labia. Yes. <laughs> she was. Yeah, there's some politics there too <laughs> about the way we fold together. Thank you. Um, I want to come back to the question. I know it's a question we both share, uh, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm mindful to ask it because I do want to eventually in, involve all of us in this conversation. But uh, I want to come back to what you said uh, in your remarks about time, um, particularly because central to your uh, rethinking of time is uh, a, a theologian who's a favorite of mine, um, Paul Tillich. And you, you, you uh, appeal to him rather directly in talking about Kairos as opposed to Kronos and are, are trying to teach us something about how we ought not to fall into a temporal panic. So in a way, I'm kind of following up on a question that Andrea has already asked us, but um, I, I wonder if you could say a bit more about how thinking differently about time, particularly compressed time, uh, this time of, of, of Kairos that you uh, are working with in Tillich and, and in, in St. Paul, uh, the, the first Paul <laughs> for, for us, not just Paulus Tillich. Uh, what's, what is it that you're trying to teach us about not freaking out? Um, 
I think we still have to hear more about that because I, I think all of us are, are to some extent quite prone, particularly as you said, because of the IPCC report, prone to freaking out. Um, yeah. and, and you're trying to help us out of that, so. And there was that New York Times article, and I just think it's interesting when the New York Times, which is really so moderate and mostly has been really irresponsibly unengaged in, in environmental issues, but it, it, it had that, <laughs> that very well done magazine article on uh, time, <laughs> time to panic. And it was an argument for maybe uh, maybe how a certain edge of panic is, is necessary um, for getting us mobilized. And that might be true. And I want to think about that before I finish my Apocalypse After All book. Because I would, I would assume... By the way, that book is a question mark, right? Yes. yes. Apocalypse After All, question mark. <laughs> Very important. Thank you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I would... I would want to um, <coughs> to think with the, the the mode of panic here as something more than just what what causes us to freeze in paralysis. I suspect there's a moment of panic, a moment of fear that opens up awareness. The problem is if that then gets reified, if in the the, the Buddhist sense of, of of clinging and reifying, we we cling to that that fear, that panic, then I think it's, uh, it, it, it just takes us down. It, because it shuts us down. And so instead of resisting and fighting uh, what is frightening us, we become its, its early victims. Um, so it might be that the panic is necessary for open, opening us up to the immensity of the problem. Think about that word, panic. <laughs> So maybe the answer to panic, which is a fear of it's all, all too much, uh, is, is actually a kind of pen and theos of all in God, God in all, um, which doesn't mean that God will fix it for us, not in this point of view. There's no chance of that. It hasn't ever happened. God doesn't step in and fix. God, God isn't the the one who intervenes in what he, with the capital H, uh, could have prevented anyway, all of those genocides and holocausts and enslavements. Um, never mind the omnipotence question now, but that, that to, to avoid that theology and enter into a, a meditative theology that empowers us, I think requires a different temporality in, in your saint. Paulus, <laughs> with his kairos, really takes us deep into the, 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 the meaning of that sun estal emnos, that, 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 that I don't know that he reflected on that contracted character directly, but Agamben makes the connection uh, beautifully in a way that then allows us to bring the, the Pauline kairos in, that in the fullness of time is a, a breaking open of a potentiality that's in, in some sense always there, mm -hmm. but in a sense that's never detached uh, from the historical context in which that moment happens. For me, that it's very important to not let that Kairos moment be the, the great exception. <laughs> which I don't think it is for, Cairo, for the Pauline <laughs> Tilikian Kairos either. I think it's actually an instantiation of, of being itself, so the opposite of exceptionalism. And I connect it to the, the, the moments of becoming uh, in the Whiteheadian cosmology, where every, everything that is exists only, that means you, <laughs> as a moment of becoming, of becoming in these relations that are unfolding and shifting even as we, we think together. So the, the time is bursting open with potentiality if we can tune into it. And yet the potentiality carries also uh, the, the threats. So there's, <laughs> there's the, the full ambiguous potentiality of history, but somehow internally and darkly illumined 
by, <laughs> by what I have called the inception, the new beginning, the chance of a new beginning, that chirotic promise, the possibility for something better. The example that comes to me, because I was just in, in Sweden for a week and learned there about someone I should have known about, Mrs. Greta. You aware of Greta? Greta Unberg. I, I think she's just starting to hit the news. Uh, but there was the, the first of the really international uh, walkouts, the protest walkouts uh, from schools uh, uh, that happened on my first Friday there. And I learned that she's the 16-year-old Swede who started walking out of school on many Fridays and others with her. And, and it's because, it, and it's a sense of time, and there's a panicky edge to it. Like, uh, what, the basic thesis is, why should we go to school to prepare for a future that we're not going to have? Uh, so she's not saying drop out, but she is saying walk out uh, in these regular protests, and that's just starting to happen, happen big time, uh, various points on the west coast of the United States, and, and big in, in London. Um, and she's a young woman with Asperger's, which so, so somehow this disability is part of what helped her be open to a possibility that seems impossible. And she's in her way now changing the world. I think that says something about a, a temporality that has a strong sense of, of urgency, but that is turning catastrophe into catalyst. I think we have time for one more question from us before we go to you. I, uh, I was sitting here trying to decide what my last question ought to be, and I, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to ask you <laughs> one in three, and I've come up with an alliteration. They're about activism, amazement, and art. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll, do, I'll do all three, and then you can respond to the one you like the most, or we can table them and hear from the others, but at least you can hear the questions. You speak of a political apoph apophasis, the apophatic unknowing that cultivates hospitality to a shared un uncertainty a difficult sociality, as you put it. But this apophatic is also activist. What can you tell us about the ethical thrust in your political theology of an emergent inception? Uh, and then, uh, regarding amazement, the precarious is so clearly illuminated, but there's also no absence of wonder. So I want, wanted to hear how wonder <laughs> figures in. And then finally, there's a, tre a hidden treasure in your book that's uh, maybe a little easy to miss if, if one reads too quickly, although this is not a book you can read too quickly. Um, and it's the role of art and how it plays mm. a, a role in your book. And if I were to run a show of visual and performing arts alongside a book exhibit of the political theology of the earth, I would include Leonard Cohen's Broken Hallelujah that you reference, Paul Clay's Angel of History and uh, uh, reading of Ed Roberson's poetry. So my question is, how does art figure in your political theology of an emergent inception? <laughs> That's my last question. That's a sort of deceptive question that's really so beautifully self-answering <laughs> that I can, I can pretty much let it stand. But I, I will point out that I'll be tempted to you know, to, to steal your, your meditation on those three A's, as I do the three A's of apocalypse after all, question mark. I, I, I point out, because this might end up being of interest for the insight theories, that I, I touched upon, uh, late in writing the book, the concept of apophatic Marxism, uh, which is coined by, by the, the, the great novelist uh, of the fantasy genre, China Miaville. Uh, who also uh, is the editor of the, the journal Salvage, uh, the Marxist journal in the UK. Uh, and he has a wondrous essay in the, in the most recent uh, issue of the journal. And I have the link I can pass to anyone. He just sent it to me, so I've got the free link. <laughs> but uh, he really goes deep in. He's a 
as an atheist <laughs> Marxist, uh, but uh, he's been reading uh, apophatic theology like crazy for a few years, <laughs> and now he's bringing them together because he is so angry at, at what he calls this, the certitude of certitudes in the hard left. And so he's in deep critique of a lot of his fellow Marxists for their certaintism, their cataphatic, that's the opposite of apophatic, uh, sense that they know. And he thinks it's, it's destroying any chance of really drawing in the younger generation uh, who are insistent upon the intersections of multiple issues and who face great uncertainty <laughs> in no small measure because of the climate. And so he's really developed this notion now of apophatic Marxism as a way, as a way of, of being ethical in our modes of resistance. Apophasis was never just so I don't know. <laughs> it was never like a relativism or a quietism. It was an insistence that because we don't know for sure, uh, there is a lot that we must learn and must keep learning so that the knowledge that we do have, we can express some confidence in, recognizing always that it has to be uh, unfolding and being open to criticism uh, and, and, and changing, including our knowledge of God, according to that uh, ancient apophatic tradition. So there's a, a deep ethos in the, in the silence, yeah. an ethos of activism, amazement, and art. <laughs> Thank you for your activism amazement <laughs> and your amazingness and artfulness in this, in this kind of reflection, Andrea. Well, let's uh, turn to you. I think there's a microphone that will be brought to you, so just raise your hand and uh, we'll in include you in this um, entanglement. Maybe we'll even become a murmuration. <laughs> I can see us flying around in the chapel together. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you. Uh, my name is David Carr. I'm a, actually a biblical scholar who's a Quaker, so I appreciate many aspects of what you talked about tonight in your work. And one of the things I've really appreciated about your work is the way you um, very seriously engage the Bible, um, much more seriously than many uh, theologians. And in relation to that, I was thinking about in terms of the topic for tonight, one of the things as I'm sure as you're very conscious of um, is there these expressions that have very different meanings in popular parlance than they do in the Bible. And I would count apocalypse among them. That is, uh, within the broader sort of popular culture, apocalypse means just the end. Whereas um, the two major examples of apocalypses within the Bible, Daniel and Revelation and most other historical apocalypses, have that in time, like the crisis point, only as the second to last chapter of a story that ends with everything getting put back into order by God. Um, and there's a somewhat sometimes passive sort of rhetoric that seems to be attached to that whole thing. Maybe you wouldn't agree with that. You've done a lot more writing on Apocalypse than I actually have. But I was curious in light, if insofar as there's this difference between the way many people talk about Apocalypse and the way the Bible talks about Apocalypses, is there something you find evocative or something that we might learn from that different model of Bible? Or possibly are you seeing a need to pretty explicitly critique some of those aspects of the biblical narrative where it all ends up going forward past that crisis point to a glorious rearrangement. Well, thank you, David. It would be good to uh, uh, talk some more so that I can actually finish my apocalypse after all. It, it's hard to come to the end of a book that is reflecting on this symbol of the end uh, and actually finds that the end of the world doesn't, doesn't happen there. So I, I think because we're going to hear more and more apocalyptic rhetoric, both on the right and the left, it's crucial uh, for at least uh, some 
subpopulation of the public to get better informed about how the symbol actually works in its original context, what it actually does mean, not because we can then refer, return to uh, a biblical apocalypticism. I, I don't think that's quite what we'd want to do. Uh, but there are elements of it that I think we might find ourselves attracted to once we, once we open them up. So what I'm, my hermeneutical method in this book I'm writing now, which is for a wide public, is called Dream Reading the Apocalypse. And it's understanding John to have been dream reading prior uh, prophetic visions and apocalypses, and I think dreams of his own. Um, so in my first apocalypse book, I, I, I was much more preoccupied with his really uh, bitter, dualistic, misogynist, <laughs> destructiveness of vision, uh, the incredible violence, finally, of divine justice, and how this all gets realized <laughs> over and over in Christian history, sometimes quite intentionally. Uh, but I saw the other side. I learned about that gradually before I finished that book. Uh, in, this, in this millennium, I'm, I'm less concerned to debunk uh, John of Potmos. I, continue to name the problems. Uh, but it, I'm, I'm feeling a bit disarmed at the prophetic power of aspects of the vision, uh, the recognition of how the combination of, of, of global uh, imperial force, that's what we called the beast, and the, the global economic system of imperial injustice which he called the great whore, uh, are working together uh, in a way that also in involves tremendously dangerous uh, self-contradictions. I'll come back and do something on that book when it's done sometime. But yeah, I, and there is an awareness of you know, the eagle crying out, whoa, 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 to all the creatures of the earth. Uh, early on as the destruction, destructive socio-ecological spiral gets going after the silence in heaven for half an hour, that's apophatic mournfulness. It's said that a third of the trees of the earth burn. And I, I somehow had come back into that just as friends of mine were endangered by uh, a round of the big, big climate-driven new fires of California. And the next verse, a third of the life of the C died. Well, I, I think we're very close to that now, since half of the coral reefs are gone and they're the basis. So I, I want to meditate on it, not because John of Potmos is predicting anything happening now. Prophecy is not prediction. Uh, it's, it's a deep reading, maybe a dream reading, of, of patterns that are systemically entrenched and that might be so deeply entrenched that they, they don't relent for centuries. And I think in this case, uh, millennia. So I, I think this meditation will have something for us. Um, I'm going to piggyback on uh, uh, Dr. White's first Question, well, actually, a number of your questions, and I also don't think it's unrelated from Dr. Carr's question about ends and uh, apocalypse as disclosure, but um, it strikes me that like I, two or three of the questions you've been asked already have been about affect or time, um, and it's been a while since I read the book, but I like could list a few, and hope, obviously, um, resentment, agony, antagonism, uh, lament even. Um, so I kind of want to piggyback again on, on, uh, on the question of, uh, I'll hold it closer to my mouth, oh, and I'll talk with this hand. Um, uh, questions of affect, um, and then I would kind of want to add to it uh, a second, a corollary question. And the first question is, I know you talk a bit about lament in the book, um, but I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about the relationship between grief and hope or lament and hope more extensively. Um, and the reason I ask that is because um, 
And I also appreciate the mention of Greta and the Fridays for the Future walkouts. Because um, it's another thing that strikes me is that um, the generation that is uh, mobilizing in this way and also the generation that's a little older, um, millennials, which kind of has its own apocalyptic valence, um, we're born into a world of degeneration in terms of climate, and you talk a lot of, in the book about for various forms of failure. Um, we might also talk about various forms of dying. Um, so that's the context for the question. The second question is um, what that might all mean for students of theology and ministry. It strikes me, uh, another thing that strikes me is that religion offers significant practices for dealing with mourning and grief. Um, so that's a cluster for you. <laughs> I'm also told briefly that's going to be the last question, so. Uh, oh, thank you, Winfield. So Winfield actually did some serious editing, an earlier version of this manuscript, when he was a mere MA student at True. Um, and it was really some crucial conversation. So thank you for staying in this spiral of communication. Um, yeah, it's so important, isn't it, that folk who have, who have responsibility for communities and particularly for spiritual or religious communities are in the position of, of leading uh, rituals, of instigating uh, group liturgies of mourning, rituals, work groups, uh, modes of, of communal and sometimes truly ceremonial grief work uh, because yes, without the grief work, uh, the hope just gets numbed out. Uh, and this has always been the case and there is that aspect of, of Christianity like with most of the world religions that knows to do deep, deep grieving and lament and there's the triumphalist exceptionalist side that thinks you know all of the suffering has been done for us by our lord on the cross you know so we don't grieve we just rejoice uh in the resurrection well shelly rambo has written beautifully about what it meant that we lost those three days of of, of deep mourning especially focused in holy saturday uh and those traditions uh that take the loss uh of what of the great hope for the messianic age <laughs> more seriously and that can have a personal uh meaning but it has a profound political meaning as well so any resurrection any insurrection any inception uh that i think you'd want to be part of will come out of deep grief work uh Otherwise, it's going to be some form of, of antagonistic certitude and sheer oppositionalism that will probably just further the destructive spiral. But, you know, uh, the, the powers, uh, hope draped in black, works very systematically with the concept of, of, of grief uh, in relation uh, to race. And all the important work now being done about trauma theory uh, and, and also and, uh, moral injury as well uh, shows the importance of, of, of finding ways to, to narrate uh, the losses, the traumas, uh, so, that, uh, so that not that we can get over them, uh, but that we can live otherwise and new possibilities for enlivenment come into play. And yes, my generation and the ones before have imposed on yours and the one to come uh, a world in which I, I think a kind of uh, ecological mourning is going to be um, part, of, part of all meaningful futures. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's all going to be depressing and merely downhill. But there will be, if there is consciousness allowed, <laughs> there will be awareness of, of what it means to have lost the, the 11,000 years of stability 
of the Holocene era uh, for this junk triumph of the Anthropocene. So, yeah, and rituals of, of grieving are very much part of what's going on with the, the high school students and apparently some grade school ones too, grabbing the mic <laughs> in these, these new walkouts. But it's an aroused uh, grief touched with anger and therefore producing hope. Yeah. The, the, the activist uh, writer Rebecca Solnit uh, talks about uh, hope in the in the dark, but the, if we recall, the dark isn't just a darkness of loss, but that the darkness of the the mourning and of the loss opens also into, if we will let it, a, a darkness of of meditation and possibility. That's uh, I think something that together we can work with. I think we all sense that we could profitably be in conversation with Catherine for another two hours and still not have touched the, the surface of rich and fecund thinking. Um, but, but, the, but our time does grow short in a rather literal and non-chirotic sense. Uh, really, chronos time, not kairos. Uh, we, we wanted to keep it short in part because there are books in the back to be signed and so you can uh, offer your appreciation for Catherine uh, more directly one-on-one -on -one <laughs> as you pick up the book which will allow you to continue this conversation. I also want to mention um, that uh, something that Catherine has already mentioned that we welcome you back with us for the last event of this year's series in the Insight uh, project, which is the, uh, a public lecture with Jane Bennett on April 12th at 6.30. Bennett is making this compelling argument for vibrant matter, that matter is anything but dead and inactive, and that rethinking our very idea about matter will be essential to the work of engaging the, the, uh, the situation the ecological crisis we now find ourselves in. So I hope you'll come back for that. Now, speaking of practices, an important one for all of us is the practice of thanksgiving. So we want to thank a variety of people who made this evening possible. Uh, Todd Willison, Shana Kaplanov, Winfield Goodwin, who just asked the question, Kate San, Mary Coelho, who makes this entire series possible, and of course, Andrea White and Catherine Keller. Let's take a moment to thank them all. <laughs> and now I commend to you the only form of consumerism that we theologians encourage, book buying.